Hey kids, welcome to the store lecturer. So uh, Tracy and Bruce Store endowed this uh, lectureship on the order of 40 years ago now. It's brought many, many wonderful people to the Davis campus. When Professor Coyne, as a child, was here as a postdoc, he and I showed Maynard Smith a good time, if I remember correctly. In any case, today we are here to honor my pal Coyne. Coyne is going to entertain us. Coyne is one of the uh, great evolutionary biologists of the 20th and 21st centuries. And to understand Jerry's seminal contributions, so he started running gels in Lewinton's lab. He ran gels in Dick's lab for what? seven years constantly. He vowed when he became a postdoc here in Davis that he would never touch another gel, that he had become a biologist to study organisms in nature and understand phenotypes. To hell with this molecular biology crap. He had done enough. And Coyne turned his attention as a postdoc to the origin of species and understanding the genetic differences that contribute to the genitalic differences in in various Drosophila species. Absolutely fundamental diff work on the genetics of phenotypic differences in flies. He started that work in 1979 when he came here as a postdoc in the old genetics department with our dear colleague Tim Prout, in doing it in Phil Ward's lab. He then became a professor first at University of Maryland and then moved to the University of Chicago where he spent the rest of his career. He started his absolutely revolutionary work as an assistant professor. In 1985, Coyne wrote a paper called On the Genetic Basis of Haldane's Rule. This was a fundamental paper on a subject that had gone quiet since the 1940s. So there was absolutely fundamental work by Dubjansky started in 1936, followed up by Muller and Pontecorvo in 1940, Muller in 1942, laying out this fundamental idea of what is the genetic basis of hybrid sterility and inviability. And they had this model for how that worked. I won't go through the details. Coyne wrote this absolutely phenomenal paper using clever genetic tricks, which called into question our deepest understanding of this wonderful phenomenon called Haldane's Rule. You should read the paper if you haven't. After his work in Maryland, this fundamental paper, which really brought back to life the entire field of genetics of speciation, which had been completely quiet from the 19. 40s until Coyne's, Coyne's work in 85. The next thing he did but to revolutionize the field was work that he did with his brilliant graduate student, Alan Orr, who he doesn't love anymore, as, as he will tell us today. <laughs> <laughs> they wrote a paper in 1989 uh, on the what is it, uh, origin of species in Drosophila or some such thing, that looked at patterns of speciation in Drosophila, fundamentally changed the way we view the geography of speciation and the importance of natural selection in creating reproductive isolation, in particular mating discrimination among flies. Absolutely revolutionary paper, and he's done many important things since then. Increasingly, he's become a public intellectual, and now, uh, gives the sort of lecture he will give us today. Coin. Thanks. Hello, can you hear me? Let me turn my mic on. Uh, that guy that he just talked about, that wasn't me. So, at least that's the way I always feel. Um, in 2009, my student, Alan Orr, whom Michael mentioned, gave a story lecture, and it was about the compatibility of science and religion. So, and you can see this on the web, so if you want to hear the palliative for that, that's what I'm going to talk about today, which is the exact opposite, and that's one of the reasons that Alan and I, I mean, we're still good buddies, but we don't talk about this stuff anymore. Um, could the lights be dimmed a little bit um, so we can see the slides? Is there somebody? Okay, so what I'm going to talk about today is um, titled Faith is Not a Virtue, and it's basically a lecture about the incompatibility of science and religion, but what I want to concentrate on, because there's going to be a fair amount of religion bashing, but I really, what I really want to single in on is faith and not religion. Um, faith, which I'll define briefly as belief in something where there's not much evidence for, is really the, um, the demon in this talk, and religion is merely the most pernicious and the most widespread instantiation of faith. And I want to maintain that the way religion 
finds out things, or pretends to find out things about the universe, is completely inimical to the way science does it. So what I'm going to do is, first of all, set up the problem, talk a little bit about the evidence for the incompatibility, then define science, define religion, define what I mean by incompatibility, and then explain to you why I see them as incompatible, and then talk about how religion tries to fight back against this incompatibility. And at the end, I'll try to tell you why I think this is a topic that needs to be discussed. Is there somebody at the AV that can turn the lights down, please? Oh, they're working on it? Okay, thanks. Okay, so first, a little bit of evidence for the fact that there is a, an interest in this issue. This is a plot I've done using the WorldCat, which is all the books that are in print. You can find this on the web. And so what I've done is simply go through the decades, from, the four decades from 1974 to the present, and for each decade plotted the number of books, thank you, um, that were published in any language on religion and then made a quotient, which is the proportion of those books that are about the relationship of science and religion. And as you see, it's, it's not huge. It's about 1% of the books on religion deal with the relationship of science and religion. But over the last two decades, it's grown pretty strongly. It's more than doubled from about 1% to 2.5%. It's not a, you know, a huge absolute number, but it's, it's highly significant. And it's a, you can see that the interest is going up, and I expect it's going to go up even more. So the relationship of science and religion is something that people are deeply concerned with. And the issue that I'm going to talk about, and this is what you'll find if you look at those books, and the University of Chicago has a huge um, pile of them, is that most of those books on science and religion are trying to show that science and religion are compatible fields of inquiry, a sort of area I call accommodationism, that is science and religion can accommodate each other. And they accommodate each other each other in different ways. For example, they could be harmonious, they could be separate spheres of inquiry, they could even be helpful to each other. But regardless, accommodation means that science and religion can coexist together in an amicable relationship. And the vast majority of books that have been written on this topic are pro-accommodationist books. So this is why I'm here to try to dispel that notion that they are not accommodationist. And, um, in fact, science and religion are inimical and incompatible. Now, if, there's a lot, you, you'll hear a lot, if you're a scientist, about accommodationism. This is probably the, America's most famous scientist, Francis Collins, who's head of the National Institutes of Health. And he runs an organization, well, he ran it, he had to give it up when he became head of the NIH, called BioLogos, which was designed to convince evangelical Christians that their faith was not incompatible with evolution. And it failed miserably. It's still going on, but he was simply unable to convince these Christians um, that they could have their Jesus and their evolution too. So in that case, the accommodation failed. And, and this biologist organization and a lot of the other accommodationism that goes on in the United States is funded by the John Templeton Foundation. I don't know how many of you have heard of this, but it's founded by John Templeton, who was the mutual fund magnet, and he made billions of dollars, and then when he died, decided to devote his fortune, bequeathing it to a foundation to answer the so-called big questions of human purpose and ultimate reality. And what he meant by that was to try to reconcile science and religion, to try to show that actually science could shed light on questions of the divine, and that the divine could contribute to the progress of science. He has deep pockets, or the foundation does, they have $1.5 billion in endowments, and they disperse to scientists and other people as well something like $70 million a year, which is five times the NSF budget for evolutionary biology. So there's a lot of money that goes into fostering accommodationism. That's why you see the pro-science and religion people having so much more public influence than those like me who are against it, because we don't get any money from Templeton. If you're a member of a scientific organization, your organization, more likely than not, has an official statement that reconciles science and religion. This is from the national, sorry, from the AAAS. How many of you are members of the AAAS here? Only a few. I'm not going to like that. But they have an official statement saying that science and religion are compatible. They ask different questions about the world, and many religious leaders have affirmed that they see no conflict between evolution and religion. Of course, they didn't ask people like Jerry Falwell or Pat Robertson or anything. But this is an explicitly theological statement about how science and religion are not at odds with each other, and it's an official statement of the AAAS. Um, 
The National Academies of Science, I don't know how many people are members here, but I know there are a few in this campus. It's the most prestigious scientific organization in the United States, only the very most elite scientists, so elite that I don't even have a prayer of getting into it. They, too, have an um, official statement about the compatibility of science and religion, which you can find on their website. Because they're not a part of nature, supernatural entities cannot be investigated by science. That's not true, of course, if you think about it for a minute and all the studies of ESP and the efficacy of prayer, attempts to pit science and religion against each other create controversy where none needs to exist. And so organization after organization has statements like this. I'll just show two of them. The interesting thing about the National Academies is that 93% of the members are atheists. It's like the most atheistic organization in the United States. And I do not believe that the vast majority of the members would concur with this statement. It was concocted by the leadership to try to foster some amicability between science and religion. So if it's so palpably true that science and religion are friendly, if it's so obvious on its face that they're compatible because scientific organizations make these statements, why are we so concerned with it? Why do these books keep coming out trying to show that they're compatible if we already know that they are? Well, the answer is that they're not. They're not compatible, and they're not independent of each other, as the National Academy says. Both science and religion are competitors in trying to find out what's true about the universe, or so I will maintain in this talk. Both involve statements about the nature of reality. Now, different forms of reality, just like a biologist studies something different from a geologist, but reality nonetheless. So part of my thesis here will be that religion is a sort of a form of science, a pseudoscience, but a form of inquiry about what's real in the cosmos. And second of all, people really realize that science and religion are incompatible, if you think about it. And I'll show you some data on this in a minute. And people sense that tension between science and religion. And so they try to convince themselves by writing books and giving talks like Alan did that um, science and religion are compatible. And if they, weren't if they were compatible, then why do we have all this stuff which testifies to their incompatibility? Widespread opposition to evolution. Creationism is the most obvious example of the fight between science and religion over what is real in our universe. We have organizations like BioLogos and statements by scientific organizations trying to harmonize science and faith. We have lots of books, and if you try to keep up with the literature on science and religion, good luck, because there's books coming out every week almost, and it's driving me nuts trying to read them. Um, the conflict is perceived as real by many Americans. I'll give you data on that in a minute. And then we have this high rate of atheism among scientists. And you have to think about, why is that? Why are scientists more atheistic than the average American? And I'll give you data on that, too. Here it is. Um, if you poll Americans about the proportion of them that are atheists or agnostics, it usually comes in about 10%, 7% to 16% for the latest polls. But if you look at American scientists in general, all scientists, 42% of them are atheists and ag or agnostics. So that's already a, somewhere between a six and a threefold increase in non-belief amongst people who do science. The higher you go up in the scientific hierarchy, the more atheistic it gets. So by the time you get to what's so-called elite American universities, as defined by sociologists, 72% of the scientists are atheists or agnostics. And finally, the members of the National Academy, as I said before, 93% of them are agnostics or atheists. This is almost the exact reverse of the American public as a whole. Now, you have to ask yourself, what it, why is it? If science and religion are so compatible with each other, why are so many scientists atheists? Well, either there's something about science that draws atheists into it. That's probably partially true. But there might be something about science that turns you into an atheist. And there's a lot of evidence for that, too. And I think that that's one of the main reasons, and it's because science uses a different methodology that if you employ it on a day-to-day -day basis, you lose your faith. Here's some data showing the incompatibilities perceived by the American public. Just look at the top graph. They, they polled the American public on whether or not they saw science and religion as being fundamentally at odds with each other. Um, often in conflict, and the people that answered yes are the green bars, and the people that answered no are the blue bars. So the general public as a whole, 55% of Americans see them in conflict with one another. Although, curiously, only 36% of Americans, the same group polled, think that their religion is in conflict with science. 
So that says something about human psychology as well. And of course, if you look at those who are unaffiliated with religion, the non-believers, a lot more of them think that science and religion are in conflict. Now this is just perception. This isn't truth. I'm just telling you the way people see things, which is not exactly the same way that the scientific organizations present it. This to me is the one piece of data that's most dispositive in showing the conflict in the American mind between science and religion. This is a result of a Time Magazine rover poll taken in 2006. Americans, a fairly large sample, were asked if science found a fact that contradicted the tenets of your faith, what would you do? And you had get three choices. Reject the science and keep the tenet of your faith. Reject the tenet of your faith and accept the scientific fact or don't know. So I'll just ask you, you know, what percentage of Americans do you think would reject science in favor of their religious belief? Does anybody want to like, show? What? Okay. I, mean, I can tell what kind of crowd I'm talking to by the numbers I get. If I'm talking to a crowd full of secularists, it's, they'll say 90%. You know, something like that. It's actually 64%. So about two out of three Americans will reject a scientific fact if it conflicts with their faith. You cannot say that science and faith are compatible if when science shows something that you don't like because it goes against your religion, you reject it. Okay. And two-thirds of Americans will do that. As I said before, the most obvious instantiation of this conflict between science and religion in America is creationism. And being here in this bubble of liberalism and education in Davis, you might not realize how much Americans are opposed to evolutionary biology. This is a poll that was taken in 2012 and published last year asking Americans their views on how humans evolved. So it's about human evolution. And 46% of them were young Earth creationists that said that humans were created directly by God within the last 10,000 years. That's half of them. Another 32% said that, well, humans could have evolved, but God had a hand in it, either creating specific mutations that, say, made our big brains or gave us morality, or um, directed evolution in some teleological way towards the ultimate culmination, which is the God-worshipping creature. To another 32%. That adds up to 78%. And then only, oops, sorry, only 15% of Americans accept unguided naturalistic evolution. The way that we scientists, we evolutionary biologists accept it is a purely materialistic, naturalistic process. So only one in six or one in seven of Americans see evolution the way scientists do. The rest of them think that God either created humans out of thin air or guided their evolution. So this is how bad it is, at least in this one area. It is a crime in America that if you ask them, Americans how many people, what proportion of them believe in the existence of angels, which is something that's palpably untrue, it's 63%. And if you ask Americans how many of them believe in the main tenets of Darwin's theory, the origin of species, well, it's 47% if you accept theistic evolution, or 15% if you accept evolution the way that Darwin and the rest of us did. So that's, I mean, angels, hell, heaven, it all comes in at about 70%. Evolution is way below that. Here's another graph I made, which was a survey of 32 European countries. Each dot represents one European country, and I plotted on the x-axis the, the belief in God in those countries, which is measured in various ways. I won't go into it now, but it goes from zero to be little God to big God. And the y-axis, the acceptance of evolution, little Darwin to big Darwin. And you can see each country is a plot, and there's this negative relationship, which is highly significant. The more religious a country is, the less likely they are to accept evolution. Okay. Now, this is the correlation. It's not a causation. But you have to ask yourself, well, why do the most religious countries, the ones that are most rejecting evolution, if everything is all happy and compatible with one another? Um, it can't be that, um, that you learn about evolution and that takes away your faith from you. Because mo for most people, they learn about God a lot earlier than they learn about Darwin. There's probably an unexamined third variable here, which is socioeconomic conditions, which correlate strongly negatively with um, religiosity. But nevertheless, we won't get into that. Now, where's the U.S. in this plot? We're right there. We're second lowest. Of all the 32 European countries, only one country is lower than us in their ranking, and that's Turkey, which is nominally secular, but actually in reality Muslim. And you see, we're, we're one of the most religious. We're actually the most religious first world country, with 80% of us are more believing in religion. So this just shows you some degree of that sort of incompatibility that I'm trying to first establish before I discuss it. Now, why 
are people concerned about this problem? One reason is that as science has advanced in the last couple of decades, it's made findings that have discomfited a lot of the religious people. Some of these findings are, that, first of all, evolution is true. I mean, we've known that for 150 years, but it gets, as it gets more and more publicized with people like Neil deGrasse Tyson and Richard Dawkins and others, people get more and more nervous who are religious because there's a number of reasons why religion um, hits faith in the solar plexus. The finding of the Big Bang and the possibility that there may be more than one universe, that doesn't sit well with religious people either. Um, a biggie is morality. Francis Collins argues that the reason humans have moral instincts cannot be explained by evolutionary naturalistic processes. It has to have been bestowed by God. As we're starting to find out by looking at primates and other animals, that they have things that look very much like parts of human morality. Some empathy, spite, jealousy, good and bad parts, that maybe we evolve morality, at least partly. And it doesn't have to be given to us by God. Advances in neuroscience are telling us that free will is largely illusory. That our sense of being able to make real choices is not, that's just a sense. It's an illusion that what we really choose has been determined often long before we choose it. And there's no evidence for a soul. So all these things have sort of pushed back a lot of things that used to be the bailiwick of religion. And nevertheless, religious people don't want to be perceived as anti-science. They don't want to be seen as hicks or rednecks or people that are opposed. Because science is a big deal in our society. You use it every day. You go to the doctor, you use cell phones, you fly in airplanes. People want to retain the comforts of their faith, but they don't want to be seen as being opposed to science. So somehow they have to comport these two areas together. They need their belief, they, but they also need to feel like they're modern. They're part of modernity. A theologian told me this, which made sense, that science is part of the human story and the theologies are about stories. So they're self-consciously modern. That is, theology needs to incorporate some element of modernity into it, and as science is one of the big deals in modern life, they incorporate that as well. Another reason why um, we're having this conflict, or at least discussion about science and religion, is because of the rise of new atheism. People like Richard Dawkins, Hitchens, Harris, and Dennett, who have written these four books. And I will maintain that if there is one characteristic that separates these new atheists from the old atheists, like H.L. Mencken and Bertrand Russell, it is that the new atheists see religion as a hypothesis, as a, as a form of science, as I do. You're making statements about the way reality is. You have to have reasons to believe those statements. And those statements should, in principle, if you can, be testable. And because they fit either not testable or they fail every test, this really upsets religious people a lot. And you can see that these people, particularly Richard Dawkins, are vilified on a regular basis by religious people. Dawkins is almost seen as Satan by many people simply because he asks religious people to put up or shut up about your beliefs. Um, so if there's a lesson from all these, uh, these advances of modern science, it's this one conveyed by the Nobel laureate Steven Weinberg. The more the universe seems comprehensible, the more it also seems pointless. And by pointless, he meant, and he's had to explain it subsequently, that there is no theological or divine force guiding the course of the universe. So it's pointless in that sense. It's not pointless in the sense that our lives don't have meaning to us. It's just that that meaning is not given to us from an external source. But even a statement like that has incited a lot of rancor on the part of religious people. John Hott, um, somebody I've crossed swords with in, in public, has said that religion can't deal with this kind of statement. What religions cannot abide is the conviction that the universe and life are pointless. And by pointless, he means there's got to be something up there that gives meaning to us down here. So these are all the reasons that we have why religion and science are in conflict right now, and they're all coming together since the rise of the new atheism. So I just wanted to use that first part of the talk to tell you that, A, there is a problem, B, a lot of people deny that there's a problem, and C, why the problem still remains. And I think the problem will remain, and I'm going to tell you now why I think it's inevitable and irresolvable, and why science and religion will always be at odds with one another. To do that, I have to first define science, religion, and compatibility, because academics like definitions. So I'll try to do that as briefly as possible. Science can be conceived as many things. It can be what, like Michael and Phil and I do every day. We go to work and we do science. We act as scientists. We find out stuff. We write articles for journals. We give lectures. You can conceive of it as the stuff that that endeavor finds out. 
you know, that Haldane's rule might be due to something about the X, evolution on the X chromosome. But I prefer, and I think most people, who, philosophers of science, tend to conceive of science not as a body of data, because that body is always changing. Scientific truth is always provisional. It's a methodology for finding out what's real. I conceive of science, and I will use that in this talk, and use it when I construe incompatibility, as a way of trying to find out what's real about the universe. And that way involves the familiar things of doubting, of empirical observation, of making hypotheses and testing them against nature and rejecting them if they fail the tests, not accepting authority, having things peer-reviewed and having a consensus build up in the community before you accept something as true. And most important, repeatability. It can't be a personal thing. Science, in order to be a methodology that is of use in finding out stuff, has to be stuff that can be found out by anybody that has the proper training and equipment. As I said before, science-specific truth is provisional. We do not find absolute truth in science, although I, hate, I hesitate to say this because when we say that scientific truths are provisional, there are some scientific truths that are, I would bet my entire fortune will not change, and one of them is that evolution is true. Another one is that water has two, normal water has two hydrogen atoms and one oxygen atom. Okay. I mean, I can't envision that ever changing, but we always have to insert this caveat that Scientific truths are not absolute truths, but in many cases they come pretty close to that. The best characterization of science that I've seen was by Richard Feynman, the physicist, in a lecture he gave in Brazil. The first principle is you must not fool yourself, and you are the easiest person to fool. So you have to be very careful about that. In other words, he thought, and I agree, that science is an exquisitely designed and refined series of endeavors to keep you from finding out what you want to find out. It's a self-checking, error-correcting mechanism to keep you from fooling yourself. And I'll argue that religion is exactly the opposite. It's designed to help you fool yourself and to keep you fooling yourself for your whole life. And then at the end, when you die, you don't find out that you were wrong. <laughs> now, religion, this, I mean, it's hard to define religion because there are so many religions on this planet, thousands and thousands of them. Um, I'm just going to pick one because I think it corresponds to what most of us think of as religion and certainly the Abrahamic religions, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. It's from Dan Dennett's Breaking the Spell. Social systems whose participants avow belief in a supernatural agent or agents whose approval is to be sought. Okay. Now there are what we think of as religions that don't believe in that, like Taoism or Confucianism, some sects of Buddhism. We'll call those philosophies instead of religions. What we're really talking about are theistic religions that usually believe in an intervening God, a God that has a relationship with the planet and can do stuff. And that this, these religions usually come with two riders, one of which is that you have a personal relationship with the supernatural agent, and second of all, that that supernatural agent dictates or approves of or mandates some kind of behavior that you have, some kind of morality. So this personal relationship and these morality usually go right along with this definition of religion. As I'll show later, those, that connection is what makes religion particularly toxic. It also makes it very different from science, where there's no morality that goes along with science, um, just personal morality, and there's no um, sense of a personal connection. I mean, I admired Theodosius Dubchansky, but I don't feel like he speaks to me from beyond the grave, or that I have to behave in a way that... Um, meets his approval. Um, religion, unlike science, which has this methodology of empirical observation, falsification, testability, consensus, is based on other ways of supposedly, I put knowing in air quotes here, based on dogma, authority, revelation, scripture, and faith. That's where your empirical beliefs about the world come from if you're religious, because the, they certainly don't come from observation of the world that is reliable in any kind of scientific way. Most people are religious not because they've scanned the world and decided that's the way to feel. They're religious because they were taught to be religious when they were young. In other words, indoctrinated. This is not just my characterization. It's in the Bible itself. Um, faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen, from Hebrews. And, of course, Doubting Thomas, blessed are they that have not seen and yet have believed. Doubting Thomas was not a good guy when he asked for evidence of Jesus's Resurrection. He needed to stick his fingers in those wounds, and that wasn't good. He was dissed in the Bible for that. Okay. Um, so before I go on to what I consider the fundamental incompatibilities, 
which you've already got a sense of where I'm going here, I want to dispose quickly of two arguments that are very common for why science and religion are compatible. And the first one is by far the most common argument that I have to me, and that is that there are religious scientists. And there are religious people who are science friendly. And often these same two examples are used. Francis Collins, who's an evangelical Christian, and Ken, Kenneth Miller. Many of you biologists may know him. He's a biochemist at Brown, author of a best-selling textbook, opponent of creationism, but also an observant Catholic. And so both of these guys are extremely religious, but they're also scientists at the same time. So does that not show that science and religion are compatible? And my answer is no. What it shows is that the human mind is capable of embracing two fundamentally dichotomous ways of looking at the world at the same time. If science and religion are compatible because scientists can be religious, then you can say, well, marriage and adultery are compatible because lots of married, married people commit adultery. Or if you want to be really starky, but it's, it's an opposite um, statement, you can say, well, Catholicism and pedophilia are compatible because lots of Catholic priests are pedophiles. And they don't think there's anything wrong with that. So they have these sort of dissonant views in their head, which they're able to hold at the same time. That does not, to me, show compatibility. It shows dissonance without cognitive dissonance. You're holding incompatible views, but it doesn't drive you nuts. It's always amazed me that somebody can go to the lab and be extremely critical and evidence-based from 9 to 5, if you're a 9 to 5 scientist, and then go to church on Sunday and believe as absolute truth something you read in an unattested 2,000-year-old book. That, to me, is incompatibility. Another solution, and this is another very famous one, is that of Stephen Jay Gould in his book, Rocks of Ages. I'm sure many of you read that. Um, I don't think he really believed what he wrote in this book. I think he was trying to look like a nice guy. But nevertheless, a lot of people accept what he said, which is that they are separate magisteria. You have science over here that explains the factual character of the natural world and develops theories that coordinate the facts. And over on the other side, you have religion whose purview is meanings, morals, and purposes. And so they're absolutely separate, and there's therefore no clash between them because they're different. They're non-overlapping magisteria. Gould saw them as of equal weight. There's two things wrong with this way to reconcile science and religion. First of all, religion is obdurately naturalistic. It cannot stay out of the realm of science. Creationism is one example of that, but there's lots of assertions, assertions about the resurrection assertions about heaven, assertions about the afterlife, assertions about prayer, that are naturalistic claims. Well, not naturalistic, but metaphysical claims about the way things really are in the world. So, and they can be tested, many of these. I mean, there have been a test of the efficacy of prayer, for example. So religion does not keep its nose out of the world. As I, I have a book back in my hotel room, some arguing by a theologian that the evidence for God is that the universe started, and there had to be a cause, which is God. And second of all, we have consciousness. And you cannot explain consciousness by any kind of neurophysiological, evolutionary, or material phenomena. Those are naturalistic claims. Okay. And second of all, religion is not the sole purview of purposes, meaning, and value. Anybody who studied philosophy knows that there's a whole tradition of secular philosophy dealing with these issues beginning with the ancient Greeks. So Gould is simply wrong in saying that these magisteria are separate from one another. Now, an important part of my thesis is, again, that religion does make claims about the real world. It's not just a philosophy. It's not just a social club. It's not just a place to go on Sunday for most people and look at the potted plants and the stained glass and admire the hymns. It is a system of beliefs about what you think is true, what will happen to you, what is up there. Um, this comes directly from the Bible. This is from 1 Corinthians. If Christ be not risen, then is our preaching in vain, and your faith is also in vain. If there was no resurrection, Christianity falls down. It has no buttress to hold it up. And I think most Christians would admit that. That's why the resurrection is non-negotiable for them. But you can go to modern theologians as well, and I won't read all these, but here's three science-friendly theologians, a physicist, a historian of science, and Carl Giverson, a physicist, and Francis Collins, who show quite clearly that religion makes claims about the way things really are, that religion must have its anchorage of the way things really are and the way they happen, that religion makes claims about the natural nature of reality and cannot be sustained if those beliefs are no longer credible. So the, the beliefs on which religion rests for many people 
um, are claims about the real world. What are those claims? Well, I just took one. Create, how many of you have said the nice thing created your life? Don't be shy, Richard. <laughs> this is what's called sort of the foundational claims of Christianity. It was devised in 381 AD, um, and lots of Catholics and Christians say this in church. It's a, a statement of what you believe to be true, and I put in red every fact claim that's in this Nicene Creed. There is a God. He's the Father. He produced the Son, who, by the way, was him as well, and there's this other creature called the Holy Ghost, so there's all three of them. Um, he was born of a virgin. He came to earth. By the way, being born of a virgin is a testable scientific claim, in principle, right? Um, he, was, he, he died. He was resurrected, another testable claim. Um, he, and then he went into heaven, and he's going to come back again. And when he comes back, he's going to judge us all, the living and the dead, the quick and the dead. And if we're bad, we're going to burn. If we're good, we're going to go sit with God. And the only way they're going to sit with God is, is to um, have a baptism for the remission of sins. If you're not baptized in many faiths, you don't go to heaven. These are all fact claims. Okay. Now, some of them are granted or hard to test, but nevertheless, they should be based on reason and based on testability when they can be tested. Okay, so here's where, where I see the incompatibility between science and religion. It's on three fronts. Methodological incompatibility, a philosophical incompatibility, and an incompatibility in outcomes. And I'll explain each of these three separately. The methodological incompatibility you can summarize by this aphorism that I devised, which I quite like. In science, faith is a vice. You don't get any credit in science by saying, I believe that benzene is a, has six carbons in a ring before they discovered benzene. I have faith that a new species of Drosophila will be discovered in Sacramento in two years. I mean, they just laugh at you if you said that. But religious people say that stuff all the time. So in science, faith is a vice, and religion, faith is a virtue. And faith I use in the sense of having a fairly strong belief in the absence, or even in the face of, any evidence whatsoever. In science, we have ways of knowing that we're wrong. If somebody were to ask me, Jerry, what would make you give up your belief in evolution, I would be able to rattle off a list of at least 12 things, observations, that if confirmed by many people, would make me seriously question whether evolution was true. In religion, if you believe in the Trinity, for example, the resurrection, there's no way of knowing that you're wrong. Either you can't test it, or you're obdurate to the test. That is, you're resistant to any possible disconfirmation. And we'll talk more about that in a minute. So you have this methodological disparity. Religion sort of finds out things by either somebody tells them to you, you read them in a book, you have a revelation, or you were taught them when you were a kid. That's how you know that there's a trinity, or there's not a trinity if you're a Unitarian, or you have to be baptized to go to heaven or, or anything. Whereas in science, you, have to, you can't just go on faith. You have to actually test your claims, um, interrogate them against the real world. Now, people say, this is one of the accusations that religious people make, that scientists have faith in naturalism and materialism, that we're no better than the religious people, that we have, you know, we have this a priori commitment to explaining things using materialism, that energy and matter are all there are, and naturalism, that there are physical laws that have to be obeyed. But those aren't a priori assumptions of science. As a scientist, I do not go to work every day and say, okay, I have to find things that are absolutely compatible with naturalism and materialism. It is possible to test things that are supernatural and immaterial as scientific claims. And ESP is one of them. Any test of the paranormal is another one. I mean, those things have been tested out the wazoo. They've never been confirmed. But science does not limit itself to natural phenomena. The reason we use naturalism and materialism in our endeavors is not because we're wedded to them a priori, but because those have been the only ways that we've ever been able to make progress understanding nature. We have never made one iota of, pro of progress by trying to invoke either the divine or the paranormal or the supernatural. Now, again, I'm talking a lot about religion here, but what I say goes for anything like homeopathy, um, which the Davis Food Co-op sells many versions of, um, ESP, alien abduction, um, telekinesis, remote viewing, all of those things are pseudosciences in a form of religion, is that you have this belief about what to be true, an a priori commitment, and, um, which is not based on naturalism or materialism, and all of those endeavors have proven useless. They're either inefficacious, they, they, 
they're not, they don't work like homeopathic medicines, or they prove not to show up like ESP. Okay. So when you do this day after day after day, and century after century after century, since science started in the 16th century, eventually you realize when you don't see the hand of the divine or any odd or supernatural phenomenon appearing, that they just aren't there. And that's the philosophical incompatibility, that we have a worldview in which, a metaphysical worldview in which there is no metaphysical God or divine being interfering, philosophical. And that could change. Jesus could walk into this auditorium right now and could behave in certain ways that might convince me that he was real, but it hasn't happened. And so when you do this day after day after day, and I think this is what happens to scientists, you eventually give up belief in both the paranormal and the divine. That's the philosophical incompatibility. It's not only a difference in methods, it's a difference in worldview that results when you apply those methods. And then there's an incompatibility of outcomes. The way a revelation authority and dogma tells you that the world works gives you different results from the way science tells you how the world works. These are the results. I mean, here's some of the dichotomies between what revelation tells us, at least Christian and Jewish revelation, um, and Islamic in many cases, and science. Evolution of Adam and Eve, great flood, efficacy of prayer. Um, that should have said creation there. Um, these, none of this happened, okay? But it, it's all in the Bible, and, and for millennia, people believed it. There is nothing in the Bible that shows that, although it's supposed to be inspired by God, that says anything about scientific truths that were not comprehensible by somebody that lived at the time the Bible was written. If God really created the Bible or dictated the Quran to Muhammad, why didn't he say something like, well, you know, why don't you wash your hands after you defecate? Because... It, you might get sick less, or, you know, those creatures weren't created. They really developed very slowly over a long period of time. But none of that is in there. So the fact that the Bible is exactly what it should be if it was written by people who were scientifically illiterate and just making guesses rather than being told something by God who actually knew what was going on in the universe um, is another form of incompatibility. Okay. Another fact, another real big dichotomy between science and religion is that, that what religions say really differs from one faith to another. The outcomes differ among different religions. Different religions tell you different truths. If you look at the phylogeny of world religions, and you can do this. I mean, you can do this with linguistics. You can do it here. This is, this is by far a, 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 a sample of religion that's not complete. For example, Christianity of its orange branch. And this encompasses actually 41,000 Christian denominations. I got that from a Christian theological seminary, which is widely respected, so that's a good figure. If you look at this religion, and you take it back 20,000 years, you see that there's all these numbers of schisms between sects. Now, what those schisms are about are sometimes they're about authority, but often they're about claims about the real world. How many gods are there? What does God want us to do? Is there a trinity? Can women be priests? What do we do about the gays? Um, how many wives can you have? I mean, each one of these splits, generally, and especially this is true in the Mormon church where there's a lot of sex, represents conflicting claims about what's real. So we have all these different religions making conflicts with each other. This shows that religion is not only in conflict with science or incompatible with science. Religion is incompatible with religion because the different religions make different truth claims. In, in contrast, there's only one brand of science. Okay. Regardless of whether you're a Hindu scientist, a Muslim scientist, an atheist scientist, you all practice science the same way. You adhere to the same standards. In general, you agree on the same conceptions of what is true and what is real. Does religion, okay, so does religion reveal truth? It is part of religion's job to tell us what is true about the universe. And I put this on my website as a question of my readers, many of whom used to be religious. Has, re has revelation, dogma, or authority told us anything real about the universe that science could have told us? And the answer is no. I cannot think of a single fact about the universe that has come from theological rubination. Over a thousand years, religious inquiry has not produced a single truth about the universe, even the truths within its bailiwick. It has not told us whether there's one God or lots of gods. You know, is he a triune God or a unitarian God? What does this God want? Is he a nice God? Is he affected by the universe, or like process theology tells us, or is he not? We don't know the answers to these questions. Theology has been going on for thousands of years, and yet they cannot even settle on the simplest answers to their questions. 
Theological knowledge does not expand in the way science does. We have a sense that we're honing in on the truth, that quantum mechanics is, is a refinement of Newtonian mechanics, which is a special case of quantum mechanics. Theology doesn't have anything like that. If you read theology, you'll see that the ruminations of Thomas Aquinas and St. Augustine are right up there with the latest ones, and they're all held in equal respect. Theology has changed, but it hasn't honed in on anything that's true, at least about the divine, which is its bailiwick. And as I said, the religious truths of different faiths are conflicting with one another. Now, the normal response of a theologian who has an a priori prejudice that he has to reinforce or chi um, is that the, but the Bible isn't a textbook of science. It's not really meant to tell us anything that's true. Well, that's, not, that's hogwash, um, as you probably know. When I read this statement, and I see it all the time, what I translate it into, the Bible is not true. Okay. The Bible, what they say when they mean the Bible is a textbook and not science is that the Bible doesn't say stuff that is scientifically true. But to many people it does. Because for every religious person I've ever met, practically, there are some foundational truths that cannot be overturned. For Christians, it's usually the divinity of Jesus and the resurrection and the afterlife. So while some believers are fundamentalists about nearly everything, this is another aphorism I point, nearly all believers are fundamentalists about something. There are some rock-bottom, non-negotiable truths of religion that religious people will believe under any circumstances, and will refuse to reject those beliefs, even if there's evidence against them. This is another difference and in incompatibility between science and religion. When a scientific claim is falsified, something like cold fusion or faster than light neutrinos, it is discarded. It goes into the waste heap of bad ideas. When a religious claim is um, falsified, it simply turns into a metaphor. <laughs> Okay, and this is absolutely true. As science pushes back religion, shows that the claims in the Bible are false, people say, well, they weren't really meant to be true in the first place. They're just metaphors. And then they have the task of trying to figure out what the metaphors were. Okay, so this is a very different way. In science, if your good idea turns bad, if you don't find what you wanted, it's too bad. Nature doesn't let you believe that. In religion, you got to hold on to it somehow, so you turn it into a metaphor. Um, now, there's five, to show that religion is really a pseudoscience, I'm not going to go through these here, but theologians and religious people have certain ways of believing that are very similar to the ways that UFO believe, adherents believe, the way that homeopathic adherents believe, the way that ESP adherents believe. They hold on to their claims despite counterclaims in very similar ways. And one of the ways is to claim that, well, you're misconstruing what I meant in the first place. For religion, is the Bible doesn't say what it seems to say. One of the big kerfuffles in religion right now is the story of Adam and Eve. Um, this is a foundational claim for Christianity. That there were two ancestors of humanity. They sinned by eating from the tree of knowledge. That sin was inherited vertically as the original sin. We're all contaminated by it. That's why Jesus had to come back and get himself hung on the cross and resurrected so that there was somebody who can absolve us from that sin. We know now from population genetics that the human population never, ever was as low as two individuals. Recent work um, has shown that the lowest it could have been in the past 100,000 years or so was 12,000, 10,000 in Africa, and another 2,250 that migrated out of Africa. That's a minimum estimate. So it cannot be true that Adam and Eve existed as real ancestors of humanity. That's a problem for Christianity. It's a serious problem. It's, a, it's more serious, really, than evolution. You can claim Genesis is a metaphor, but if you're going to claim that Adam and Eve are metaphors, then you're going to have to say that Jesus died for a metaphor. And that doesn't sit well with Christians. And as we speak, Christian theologians are going crazy trying to figure out how do these people really could have existed but be metaphorical at the same time? Scientists would just say, didn't happen, let's move on. But theology can't let go. Here's another thing, that the difference between science and religion, rationalization of things you already believe. You know, through religion, you already know what you want before you do your sort of investigations. You have a prejudicial belief that you want to hold on to. And so you rationalize the method of theology, and that's why it's called apologetics, is rationalizing what you already believe in. This is John Hart again. I, I used him because I debated him, but he's made a number of statements that are very explicit. He's talking about the afterlife, and he wants to believe in the afterlife like most people do. I would like to believe in the afterlife, but I know that's not going to happen. 
Um, the way he deals with it, because there's no evidence for it, is he said, well, I don't want to capitulate to the narrow empiricism that underlies naturalistic belief. In other words, I don't need any stinking evidence for that. <laughs> capitulate to the narrow empiricism. That's real theological speak. What he will say, though, is that the hope for some form of subjective survival is a favorable disposition for nurturing and the desire to know. If somebody can explain that to me, what that means, I would be glad to hear it. But what I think it means is I believe it because it makes me feel good to believe it. And that, of course, goes along with the biblical notion of what faith is, the assurance of things hoped for. There's no evidence for an afterlife, but Hot thinks, well, if you, if you have a hope, then that hope constitutes evidence. That is the exact opposite of what science does. Hope is not evidence. It's the stuff you've got to fight against when you get your evidence. Here's another thing that religion does that science does, and they make stuff up when they don't know the answer. Well, scientists make hypotheses when we don't know answers either, but we test them, and we don't regard them as true until they've been tested. When a religious person or a theologian makes something up to answer a question, that's it. That settles it. It's the end of research. Why is God hidden? Back 2,000 years ago, God was all over the place. He was in burning bushes. He was healing lepers. There was, you know, apparitions. Even, you know, a couple centuries ago, people were seeing people in, in Fatima and other places. But there's not much evidence of God in today's world. We don't see miracles. We don't see God. Why is that? This problem of the hidden God, the deus abscondias, as theologians call it, is one that theologians wrestle with. And they have answers. <laughs> and these answers count as final answers to them. It is essential to religious experience that the ultimate reality be beyond our grasp. Because if we could grasp it, it wouldn't be ultimate. Now, this is not only a tautology, but it's a misunderstanding of what the word ultimate means. And then Polkinghorne, who used to be a physicist, and became an Anglican priest. The presence of God is veiled because when you think about it, the presence of divinity would overwhelm finite creatures, depriving us of being ourselves. This is what I call the Jack Nicholson hypothesis for God. You can't handle God. And so that's why he's hidden. <laughs> well, you know, people back in the Bible could handle God. He appeared to them in the burning bush. He appeared to Moses on Mount Sinai. They hadn't have a problem with that. But now he's hidden because if God were to show himself before us, um, we couldn't freely accept him. I, I, again, I don't know what that means. I mean, I would like that evidence because if it was there, I would freely accept God. But again, here they're just making up stuff and they've got different answers. I have a more parsimonious hypothesis for why God is hidden one that was adumbrated by Delos McCown, an uh, atheist from Alabama. The invisible and the non-existent look very much alike. That's about the smartest thing that anybody's ever said about theology. I think. <laughs> and finally, oh, well, not finally, we're almost at the end of this part, um, rationalization. Every observation you make, you can comport with your faith. There is nothing that you can see that can make you reject your faith. You saw the 64% figures of how Americans would abide by their faith rather than accept the scientific fact. That was severely tested when evolution came around. Now, there's a lot of religious people that accept evolution, but theologians had to incorporate it into their metaphysics that included the story of Genesis, of, of denial of creationism. So what do religious people do? They say, well, Genesis is a metaphor, and what, re what God really wanted, what we really have is what's better than what's in the Bible in the first place. This is called the I could have had a V8 school of theology. You know? Why didn't I figure out evolution? What, you know, well, why didn't God tell us about it in the first place? Here's two statements to this effect, one by Francisco Ayala, who used to be here. A world of life with evolution is much more exciting than just ex nihilo creationism. John Hott, isn't it a tribute to God that the world is not just passive, but actually evolves over time? In philosophy, this is called making a virtue out of necessity. And I call people that do this uh, wielders of the theological sausage machine. It was interesting when I pulled this picture of a sausage machine off the internet. It says TSM, which to me means theological sausage machine. It's what they did with evolution. <laughs> You take a scientific necessity, which science discovers, you put it through the grinder of apologetics, and it comes out a theological virtue at the end. Evolution is great. It's just what, the way God would have done it, because it's so creative. It's so forward-moving. It's self-instantiating. Of course, it's a shame that it doesn't say anything about it in the Bible. Uh, and finally, the last way that theologians fight back against the incursion of science, they make unfounded claims about reality. 
It's sort of like making stuff up. Um, but again, they're conflicting. This is Ian Barber, who's a very science-friendly and famous um, philosopher of science, who's also religious. According to Whitehead, God is influenced by events in the world. This is process theology, a fairly new form of theology that Whitehead invented, in which God actually is not unchangeable. He's affected by what goes on in the world, and there can be a back-and-forth interaction. And once it's according to Whitehead, then it's real. I mean, this is theology or assertion of fact by authority. Okay. Different faiths give different answers to the questions. They not only give different truths, but even the questions that are morality, meaning, and values, um, they don't answer either. Um, what's going on in the universe? Is there any point to it? Why are we here? Well, those questions have never been answered satisfactorily, including the big one of why there is so much suffering. The question of evil, I think, is the Achilles heel of religion. For some of these questions, science has an answer, like why do we die? My answer would be antagonistic pleiotropy, but... Religious people want a different definition. And Hod has said that he's not sure what the point of it all is, even after pondering these big questions. Okay, I won't go through the evidence against gods um, because I'm running out of time here. I'll just mention how religion fights back against these claims of science. These are counter-accusations now. They're not defensive maneuvers, but offensive maneuvers by theology. Science can't prove that God doesn't exist. If you listen to Alan Orr's 19, sorry, 2009 um, lecture, you'll hear him say that you can't prove a negative. You can't prove that God doesn't exist. That's poppycock. You can certainly prove within the bounds of reasonable proof that something doesn't exist. I will claim that the Loch Ness Monster doesn't exist. I will claim that I do not have a Lamborghini and I'm not President of the United States. Okay. If there should be evidence but there is no evidence, that is, the, that is a case where the absence of evidence is evidence for absence. Science fosters scientism, the view that science is the only reliable guide to truth. I happen to agree with this. If you construe truth as truths about the universe, science gives us no moral grounding. Indeed, it doesn't, and it shouldn't. And science is a faith like religion. I'll debate this with anybody that wants to. It is not a faith at all because we don't believe in the absence of evidence. And finally, science has been misused. We have the Tuskegee experiments. We have the atom bomb. That's not science being misused. That's the tools of science being used by people, in many cases, who are immoral or don't have very good um, morals. So in the end, can there be a dialogue between science and religion? This is the end game of all of these scientific organizations. They're calling for fruitful dialogue between science and religion, in which we can not only talk to each other, but we can help each other. And my view is that there can not only be not be fruitful dialogue, there, there can, or constructive dialogue, there can be um, a destructive monologue, that science can contribute to faith, but only in a negative way, by disproving its assertions. Conceivably, we could prove some of the assertions of faith, but we never have. So science has always been destructive to the claims of faith. Can faith contribute to science? No way. We have, as Laplace said, we have no need for supernaturalist hypotheses. There's not been one contribution that religion has ever made to the progress of science. Okay. So in the end, why does it matter? Why am I up here bashing religion, probably hurting some of your feelings? Um, I know I have because people have been taking my posters <laughs> off the walls on campus for a couple of days. Why does it matter that science and religion are incompatible? What I really want to say is what's incompatible is not so much science and religion, but faith versus rationality, of which religion is a subset of faith and science is a subset of rationality. Because re if religion was purely personal, if people believed all this crazy stuff and kept it to themselves, I would have no beef with them. The problem is that they can't for several reasons. First of all, they have to teach it to their kids, so the kids get indoctrinated with truths that, they aren't, that aren't based on rational reason or empirical observation. And second of all, they have to missionize. Okay? And they have to missionize because religion not only thinks it has a handle on the absolute truth, but it comes with a system of right and wrong. If you think you have the absolute truth and you know the right way to behave is, it's almost, and people get punished or rewarded because of those beliefs, then you almost have a duty to spread the good news to other people. And this is responsible for a lot of what the Republicans are doing. They're spreading a biblically-based morality, turning it into law. That's the bad thing about faith, because that biblically-based morality is based not on rationality or even philosophy, but simply on the dictates of faith. Um, and the duty to missionize Rodney Stark, who's a, another famous um, philosopher of religion, he 
sees religion as a kind of vaccination. That if you have a vaccination that's going to cure a disease that's inflicted, a, say, a tribe somewhere in South America, you would be remiss to withhold that from them, even if they didn't accept that kind of science, because you knew that that vaccine would cure them. And he says the same thing about religion. If you have the good fortune to be in possession of the true religion, which for him is Christianity, coincidentally enough, then you have, uh, you're obligated to spread that blessing to the less fortunate. The duty to missionize is inherent in religion. It's not inherent in science. And this is the real problem, that with faith wedded to a system of morality, you have to tell other people about it and try to impose it upon them. Why does it matter? Because faith is the opposite of rationality. It's not having good reasons for what you believe, and we cannot let our children, especially, develop belief systems that aren't based on evidence. This is what happens to kids who do. I'm almost through now. These are Jehovah's Witnesses. You may know that Jehovah's Witnesses don't believe in blood transfusions. This was actually something that was a recent innovation in the last 50 years. It's an interpretation of two biblical verses, thou shalt not eat blood, I think is one of them. So Jehovah's Witnesses don't take blood transfusions. The result is, of course, that many of them die during operations or if they're hit by cars or they have leukemia or things like that. This is a, an issue of Awake magazine. See all these kids there? They're all dead. And they're all dead because they were refused blood transfusion. They refused blood transfusions because their parents told them that they should not get a blood transfusion. How are they regarded by the Jehovah's Witnesses? Youths who put God first. They're lionized as martyrs. They're martyrs to their parents' faith. They're martyrs to a misconceived, morality-driven superstition that you are to not get transfusions. And this is not just in the Jehovah's Witnesses. It's also in the Christian scientists, many Christian sects. These poor kids get indoctrinated. They refuse medical treatment, and they die. In a world without religion, in a world that was wedded to rationality instead of faith, these kids would be alive. Okay. And there's thousands of them. And this is not just Jehovah's Witnesses. There are religious exemptions for mandatory medical care in every state in the Union. And I won't go through these one by one, but, for example, 38 states in Washington, D.C. have religious exemptions for child abuse. That is, if your kid is a diabetic and you withhold insulin from that kid because your religion says that you don't want to give him medicine and that kid dies, as they will, a horrible death, it, it's okay. You're not... You haven't violated the law because you did it for religious reasons. If you do that without having religious reasons, you could be prosecuted for child neglect, child abuse, even murder or manslaughter. So religion is given a pass here. And in all these states, there's all kinds of exemptions. California has one. If you don't believe me, here's the California statute, which says a child receiving treatment by spiritual means as provided in section blah, 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 or not receiving specified medical treatment for religious reasons shall not for that reason alone be considered a neglected child. You're only a neglected child if you neglect your kid for other reasons than religious ones. And this is the worst one, I think. I mean, it's, in this state, public school teachers are allowed to refuse being tested for tuberculosis if they have religious objections to it. Why is that? I mean, it's insane because you can spread TB to your kids. But if your religion says, well, it's against your law to be TB tested, this is a matter of public health. This is the bad stuff that comes from faith. And all the bad aspects of the Catholic Church, which I see as a really pretty malevolent institution, all of these aspects, opposition to divorce, homosexuality, oppression of women, sexual abuse of children, none of this would occur, I believe, if we had a society based on reason rather than faith. Um, Opposition to homosexuality, for example. I mean, there may be some of it if you're not based in faith, but it comes basically from the Bible. Okay, so in the end, and I'm an atheist, so I'll admit this, even though somebody's going to shoot me for it someday. Um, Sam Harris said it better than anybody else. Pretending to be certain when, no, when one isn't. Pretending to be certain about propositions for which no evidence is even conceivable is an intellectual and a moral feeling. This is the real incompatibility between science and religion. Science makes you have reasons for what you think is true. If you don't have those reasons, you have to say, I do not know. In religion, you're not under those strictures. You are subject to these intellectual and moral failings. And this attack on reason by science has been going on since the very beginning. Aquinas, Martin Luther, he made many statements about how reason has to be diluted, trampled underfoot, and even the much-beloved 
Pope Francis, whom even atheists like, because they haven't caught on to who he really is yet, has made the statements in his Easter homily last year. The spirit of curiosity is not a good spirit. It's the spirit of dispersion. It takes you away from God. Religion historically has fought against reason because reason, if you think about it, makes you non-religious. Thank you. We'll have a moment of silent prayer if anybody has to leave from this present corner. We have to answer questions. Have at me. I'm curious if you've read David Stone Wilson's 2002 book, Darwin's Cathedral, and what your thoughts are on his idea that um, humans are maybe predisposed to have a belief in God and religious beliefs. Uh, yeah, I can't hear very good. Yeah. What do you think of Sloan Wilson's book? Oh, David Sloan Wilson's book. That religion is what? Sorry, what did David say in his book? That humans have a predisposition to have these religious beliefs that sort of play a functional role in our evolution. Oh, yeah. I, I think Wilson thinks there are probably group selected adaptations, too. That we have. Um, there's a gazillion theories about why people are religious, and I can't see any evidence supporting any of them. Some people say we have genes for being religious. At least that one you can test. You bring up kids in an environment where they are not subject to any religious influence. I mean, that's impossible, but you can theoretically test that and see if they spontaneously start believing in God. I don't believe that. But, um, so we don't even have any real evidence that, that belief in God per se is genetic. There's other theories that religion is a piggy, piggybacks on aspects of humanity that were evolved, like our belief in agency, for example, or our lack of, our needing an explanation for something. Or our belief, Dawkins thinks it may be the credulity in human infants that we need to accept authorities when we're kids because that's the way we learn and that's adaptive. And so there's all these theories. About, I mean, all I can say is that there's no evidence for any of them. I mean, you can point to things that are consonant, for example, with Wilson's theory, that it's a group-selected adaptation, you know. But I don't think David Koresh's group was very <laughs> adaptive, you know. I mean, they, they extincted themselves from their religious beliefs. And I think that's what the Catholic Church, in fact, is doing now. They're holding so tenaciously on to beliefs that are insupportable in the modern world, that unless they change their dogma, they too are going to go extinct, as they are doing in this country and in Europe. So, I mean, the answer where religion comes from, I always have to say, if I'm really scientific, I don't know. It's widespread. That doesn't mean that we have genes for it. It could be that it was just passed on from our ancestors who happened to, you know, have superstitious explanations, and it's assumed these various forms in various places, just like languages have. So that would be my explanation, for, which is the non-explanation. Yeah. And surely there's some people I've offended deeply. Yes? Well, there have been psychological experiments to show that young children are prone to think teleologically, so that if you ask them why there's a lake, uh, they're more likely to pick the teleological explanation than the uh, previous cause explanation. So that could be one of many uh, psychological capacities that we have, which then religion, you know, uh, feeds upon or hijacks or whatever term you want to use. I, I, I wouldn't consider that a, uh, a sole explanation of religion, but perhaps one of many factors. Yeah, that, I mean, yeah, in response to that, I'd say you're probably right, although teleological thinking doesn't necessarily lead you to the concept of a transcendent being. Right. Much less to a god that's of the Christian sort or anything like that. Right. So it's many yeah. steps yeah, there's many steps beyond that. And, I mean, and the credulity explanation has certainly got to play a role, too. I mean, kids will believe what you tell them. So if you tell a kid who's in Saudi Arabia that, you know, women's testimony in court is worth half of a man's, which it is under Sharia law, they're going to believe you. I mean, because that's adept. I believe that the, the credulity of children is an adaptive phenomenon because it had to be that you would have to listen to what your parents told you in our ancestral environment where you you die. But how it got started in the first place, that's the mystery to me. I mean, you know, these things may play a role today, but, you know, where religion came from in the first place and why so many people are religious today. And, you know, there are countries where there are, are no religions. I mean, well, you know, Czechoslovakia is one, but Sweden, Denmark, and the Scandinavian countries, those are about 80 to 85 percent non-believers. So if religion is really answering some fundamental human need, then it's got to be human need that's not so deeply ingrained that it cannot be overcome. You know? And I think that a world without religion is actually perfectly conceivable. And I actually 
in my optimistic moments, I think that's what we're coming to. So. Yeah. question, which he did once, and that's how he answered all comments and questions, but now I will speak to that. Um, it is true that religious people have made scientific advances. I mean, when science started in the 16th century or earlier, everybody was religious. Newton was religious, although he wasn't a Trinitarian. He would have been prosecuted as a heretic. Galileo was religious. Um, the Lemaitre, the guy that thought of the Big Bang, was in fact a Catholic priest. You know, So, yeah, you can make religious advances, but that does not mean that with the other part of your brain, when you go to church and you say, well, I'm going to go to heaven after I die, that has no more credibility coming from the Maitre or the Pope or anybody else. That's what I meant by theology doesn't advance. There are no authorities in theology because there's nobody that knows anything more about the divine than anybody else. So all these people that made these great scientific discoveries and religious, and Francis Collins is one of them. I mean, he headed the Human Genome Project which was, I mean, he's a smart guy, but he's no smarter <laughs> when it comes to religion than, than any fundamentalist Bible thumper in, in the South, because Francis Collins says things that are just as stupid as, like, morality could not possibly have evolved. The moral law has to have been put in humans by God. That's as dumb as saying that the animals and plants have to have been poofed into existence. So, I mean, no, I think there's a book, by Michael Shermer, Why Smart People Believe Weird Things, which explains this phenomenon. It's because smart people are better at deceiving themselves than people that aren't as smart. They're better at rationalizing their beliefs. They're better, you know, better thinking of themselves. Smart is not in the title. Sorry? Smart is not in the title of that book. It's just why people believe weird Okay, sorry, why people believe weird things. Yeah, I haven't read it in a while. But he, he deals with this phenomenon of why people that are extremely intelligent still are, you know, not just not just religion. I mean, there's people that believe in UFOs. Um, there's plenty of people that, really intelligent people that have crazy beliefs. Lynn Margulis, who was a really smart <laughs> scientist, she's the one who discovered that um, mitochondria were actually the remnants of ancient bacteria. She was a 9-11 conspiracy theorist. Thought the U.S. blew up the World Trade Center. <laughs> you know, that, that didn't give her, she had no more credibility there than she, that was a religious belief to her, in effect. It is, it was based on faith. It was based on beliefs that she wanted without evidence. So, you know, I don't think smart people, well, I mean, in general, smart people probably believe less, fewer dumb things. But when they do believe dumb things, they're really good at convincing people that that's what theologians are. They're extremely smart people that are wasting their time rationalizing things that they were taught when they were children. Yeah. yeah. 
So when you give an argument against the compatibility of science and religion, a lot of your examples talk about very specific things about religion, so resurrection or belief in Jesus. Yeah. But what about just sort of a bare-bones belief in the existence of God? Why is that incompatible with science? Well, it is, it isn't if you define God. Did everybody hear the question? So what, Aaron, if you... Okay, so why isn't science just incompatible with the existence of God? Um, I'd say if you believe in a deistic God... The ground of being. I'm reading a book now by David Bentley Hart. Who, I mean, what theologians have done now, and I believe this is deliberate, is they've defined God out of the realm of testability. Because they know that if they make specific claims about how God works, like answers prayers, science is going to disprove them. So they say, well, that's not the kind of God that there really is. There's this thing that's not only out there, but imminent and everything. It's the ground of being. And, and it, it turns into a theo babble that's so arcane that you really don't know what they're talking about. But if you believe in a God that does not interact with the world then and doesn't do anything, then there are no predictions or testable things that follow from that. And yeah, I would say that's compatible with science. But then I'd ask you, why do you believe that? What reasons do you have for believing in such a God? Which is what I would ask David Benton Hart. Why don't you believe that, you're, that there's a big fairy up there? Or that there's space aliens? You know, I mean, if there's no reason to believe something, then why would you believe it? And for something like that, I'd say, well, the only reason you want you believe it is because you want to believe it. And, you know, the space alien thing would hold for that, too. You're just believing something that makes you feel good. And I think that's sort of incompatible with science, too, because you're holding that something exists, as David Bentley Hart does. He says, this is God. And it's a certainty statement, you know, I, but it's not the kind of God you can test scientifically. But what reasons does he have? To believe that. And that's when you abandon rationality. And I find that that's inimical to the spirit of science. You know, The scientists would say, well, I mean, to, to be truly a scientist, you, you can't be an atheist. Well, you, I mean, I am an atheist in the sense that I do not believe in God. But, you know, the true scientific attitude towards the divine is, well, it might be true, but we don't have any evidence for it. And in my book I'm writing on this, I have a little bit about what it would take to convince me that there was God. And I could be convinced. That's the true scientific attitude. I have not seen such evidence. I haven't seen evidence for the Loch Ness Monster. So my belief in God is on a par with my belief in the Loch Ness Monster. But yeah, pure deism is compatible with science. But the fact is that the religious people of the world are not deists. <laughs> The vast majority of them believe in a personal God. And it's something like 92% of American believers believe in that kind of personal God. So one more question. I have this fun belief in having a drink at 5.30 if at all times. <laughs> <laughs> I'll take one more question. Really? Okay, you go on all night. <laughs> what are your thoughts on the is-ought problem? That science tells us what is, but faith can tell us about what things ought to be. Do you believe in thought? No, not really. I mean, if faith tells us what to be, but why don't you tell me? what faith tells us ought to be. Because the different faiths tell us different things about what it ought to be. I mean, the idea of values. Well, I think that that's, you know, I don't believe that there is an objective morality. Moreover, I believe that it, what morality there is, religion is the worst way to try to find out that morality. Because look what religion has done. I mean, they go into the bedrooms. Alabama has outlawed sex toys. I just wrote something on that. They don't like homosexuals. I mean, what is all this intrusion into people's sex lives? Is this the kind of morality that religion gives us? Is it the kind of morality it gives us that, that we should kill gay people like Islam maintains? Or that women should be marginalized? They shouldn't be able to go out without a male relative? They shouldn't be able to drive? I mean, religion really does a crappy job of morality, so, you know. So you bring up all these negative things about, like, people telling other people what they cannot do. But what about positive things? What about things like love? Like what? Love. Love. Why well, haven't ancient Greeks talked about love and they didn't believe in God? I mean, you know, look, I'm not saying that everything a religion does is bad. I mean, you'd be foolish to maintain that. I think a lot of atheists who try to take that line are shooting themselves in the foot because there are religiously based charities, for example, and they do form communities that help people. Oh, often that help goes with explicit missionizing. I mean, I've met missionaries that say, you know, when I was sent out in the field, I was told, give the kids food, but make sure that they believe in Jesus. But, no, but, I mean, if you're a member of, especially of a liberal church, you will be, your missionizing will generally be for social justice, and that's a good thing. I would maintain, however, that we do not need religion to do that. And my evidence for that is that if you look at these countries, like Sweden, Denmark, Norway, um, France, and Germany, which are largely atheistic, they're not 
They're just as moral, if not more so, than the United States. They have socialized health care. They take care of their old people. They take care of their sick people. They're not depending on religion to tell them that. I mean, I don't think goodness comes from godness, you know. It's a way of channeling it in a community. And, yes, religions do some good things. But in the net, I think that if we got rid of religion, we would find a way to still do those good things. And we jettison all the superstition and the hatred and the the otherness that that go along with religion. So as terms of moral values, you know, I don't think that there are objective moral values. You know, we could argue about that all night. Um, Some philosophers think there are, but... I think that morality is something that humans concoct as a way to help us live together in a community without rancor. So, thank you for that. So we have.